Cool. Great. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Nice to see you all. Nice to be here with you all. Hi, friends online. This is the Wednesday night well of being. I'm Eve Ekman. Get to sit here with you all and make our way through some really beautiful texts together. And I think what's really special about practicing in community is the opportunity to reflect in an embodied way. What is it like to try to bring these practices together with other people, kind of moving our minds together around the ideas and really considering how to apply them. I was this week reflecting on how many of the books that we've read here together are written by people who are in full-time monastic retreat. And most of us aren't here, right? At least yet. And that doesn't in any way diminish the benefit we can get from these practices. And I think especially, maybe most especially, what this book really highlights. And so we are moving through this text of the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. It's an eighth century text, but with commentary by Pema Chodron, a contemporary uh, Tibetan Buddhist teacher. And a big emphasis of this book, three main parts of the book, convincing you why bodhicitta is so important. And then the second part, how the heck do we <laughs> stabilize in bodhicitta? And then the third part, like how do we let it infuse our whole life? And we're still in this very first part of kind of this, um, in some ways, trying to woo you, trying to make you fall in love with bodhicitta. And that is a kind of practice you can do every day, all the time. You definitely don't need to be in monastic retreat. And in fact, you know, as we've been reading these last couple of weeks together, bodhicitta is a practice explicitly designed to be in the fire of the world, right? Right in the middle of everything. So here we are in the fire of the world, poly crisis. I kind of like that term. Um, feels very San Francisco. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but you know, climate, social, um, political, like there's just so much that we are in the fire of. And this practice, you know, it asks us in some ways to feel as though the heart can rest in the aspiration of bodhicitta. That bodhicitta is, is an actual refuge for us, so then we can take action. It's, it's interesting to think of it that way. So this aspiration, I, I love to read just the very, <clears throat> the pith one from Shantideva, this aspiration, as long as space remains, this, as long as space endures, as long as there are beings to be found, may I continue likewise to remain, to drive away the sorrows of the world. So this idea of committing oneself to be of service to all other beings, that that could make the heart feel restful. It's a little bit paradoxical, but if we start to kind of peel back the layers of what makes us feel not at ease, what gets in the way of our peace of mind? Anybody got something? Yeah. Okay, that's hard. Yes, yes. What, but what about like the contents of the mind? Because what bodhicitta really is, it's, it's um, you know, the very famous line from this book, spoiler alert, is we cannot cover the world in leather in order to protect our feet, but we can cover our feet with leather and walk anywhere we want. And bodhicitta is that wrapping of the mind with this sense of, I am here for all beings. And I will endeavor time and time again to keep working with my heart and mind so that I can kind of walk freely with, through, and support the suffering of the world. Right? So, and again, it's this idea, paradoxically, that opening oneself to all of the suffering is actually what will give us enough energy and clarity to move towards and work with the suffering of the world. But it's a good thing to explore. So like, what are the kinds of things that create stress in people's lives, generally? Yeah, worrying, I'm totally with you, worrying about the future, right? 
And, you know, so many things can go wrong in the future, right? That can be, um, where am I going to work? Where am I going to live? You know, am I in the right partnership? Do I need a new partner? Do I get rid of, you know, like all these worries. And a lot of it is, you know, an underlying sense that things aren't already okay as they are. And if we apply bodhicitta to it, I mean, does, do other people in the room relate to this worry that things aren't okay as they are? Then it like connects us to everyone, first of all, like, oh yeah, we all struggle with this. It kind of makes sense that we'd be vigilant and looking around towards what isn't right. That's kind of part of the human condition. And then this idea that we could kind of work with this mind that worries and that by working with the mind that worries, we're doing so with this clear intention of helping others. So you're doing the same activities and behavior, the same thing that you want to be free from, but it's just infused with this kind of greater or vaster view. So just to get very practical on this, I was thinking about, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you all too, but even in the last couple of weeks of refreshing myself with this text, I've read this text many, many times. I've this is the third time I've taught it, and yet still, I'm like, oh yeah, everybody else first. You know, like what if that was the way my mind responded of how can I be of service? And so today, for example, I um, had a meeting with someone who were, remain unnamed and is very opinionated. And they had a experience of feeling, um, I was trying to promote a point of view that the brain is the most important thing about human psychology, which I actually don't believe and they were going hard on but that's not all consciousness and the mind and body and this part of me wanted to kind of rise up and say that's not what I said and you don't know you know this desire to be right and to defend myself against this person and there was this tiny glimmer of is this going to help this person is this the kindest thing I can do it's right it would help me feel better but it's actually not the kindest thing. And I was like, oh my God, bodhicitta, there we go. Right, like just in these small ways that we're huge, huge, vast view. Bodhicitta asks us huge, vast view. And then we are kind of engaging in this possibility that this huge, vast view starts to find its way and make its way through our very simple day-to-day -day activities. And even, you know, the added wish would be May everyone who's annoyed by someone opinion, opinionated not react. Like imagine, right? Like I could have reacted, then he would have, like it would have been a whole different scenario. And to really kind of rejoice when we have that moment where bodhicitta is just living through us. And then yesterday when um, I was out surfing with someone who will remain unnamed as well, um, <laughs> there kept being other surfers who paddled over to the wave that we were on. And there was an entire beach where there was very few other people. And it felt like they were coming on our wave. And I felt the limits of my bodhicitta. <laughs> and it was like very real. Um, Cause I, you know, definitely like, it was like, I want this and you're in the way of it. And so I, I just think it's important to be honest with ourselves, and then, you know, name like, oh, this is, this is my new edge, right? And it's silly and ridiculous, but that is how we live it. It's not just these beautiful, you know, as long as space endures, right? So too shall I endure, except if you get on my wave, to eliminate, right? So it's like, how do we really apply it? And I would just be curious from folks in these last couple of weeks, for those who've been coming, have you noticed like any bodhicitta seeping in to how you're seeing and how you're moving through? Any examples people would be willing to share? I think it's important. Yeah, Jimmy. I've been, uh, you want to use that amazing cordless mic? It doesn't move on its own, sadly, but. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. Yeah. Um, the last few days and for another couple of weeks, I'm going to be staying in Noe Valley, taking care of a friend of mine's old German shepherd. She's a real sweetheart, but I have to, they don't have a yard, so I take this dog out for walks in the neighborhood five times a day. And, um, 
And I found myself being really slow and careful when I'm walking around and crossing the street mm. and making sure I stop and let the cars go mm. and let people walk in front of me. And I'm being, I've been really, really, and it's felt really good mm. every time I do that. And I find that when I'm okay, when I'm sitting regularly, I'm eating right, I'm sleeping enough, I'm, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, it's easier yeah. for me to let other people have the right of way. And that sort of, and that goes in a lot of other areas in my life, hmm. letting other people have the right of way, letting other people um, uh, have what they need when in any given situation and sort of back away a little bit from me got got to get across that street yes and I gotta get, that's right you know in front of this yeah 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 great an old german shepherd teacher i love it yeah she's great yeah she's great thank you yeah I also have one I, I i saw a hand here first maybe no no Okay. I, I had a little um, minor road rage incident that um, demonstrated both bodhicitta and no bodhicitta. Yeah. <laughs> the first one was all of our traffic got diverted and we were taking turns making a left and, and as it was my turn, the next guy coming across, no, he decided that it was his turn. Yes. And I honked my horn and he honked his horn and I threw up my arms and I yelled something and he went crazy. He tried to pass me. He ended up like driving past all the traffic all the way up the street with everybody honking at him. Yeah. It just, it just like set him off. Yeah. And I saw that I didn't want to, I didn't want to do like my, my actions. Yeah. Contributed. Contributed to this. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, yeah. I, I felt I felt it. And yeah. I felt sorry that I'd done that. I, yeah. I was concerned about him. Yeah. Thank you. So I turned a corner, <laughs> and the same thing happened. <laughs> Except this time, I was going up 17th, and there was no stop signs, and some guy pulled out, honked his horn at me, and pulled up behind me, and I just wished him well <laughs> in my heart. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it dissolved. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't go nuts. He didn't yeah. keep honking his horn. Nothing happened. But I just I just felt as like, you know, whatever that guy's going through. Yeah. You know, I yes. hope he's okay. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And that's a great, you know, direct application. Like, again, bodhicitta isn't just something we are doing for others. You know, at the end of the day, all of that, either the energy Jimmy's describing of like, exerting our way through, pushing our way through, or the kind of aggression that we might have, you know, towards others, that accumulates in the body and the mind, you know, and that makes it harder for our body and mind to be restful. But if we choose, like that just slight difference of like choosing, I'm not going to engage, I'm going to actually relax, I'm going to, you know, do this other way of being, that also has a huge impact, you know very clear impact yeah in both directions yeah 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 and i think you know part of this phase or stage with um you know getting to know bodhicitta dating bodhicitta is um to really start to pay attention like how does it feel when i engage with this mindset um and you know then see how it might affect and it's this idea again this huge vast view but then how does it kind of how does it come? And then as you described, Ron, you know, saying like, may everyone who is just losing their mind in the car be okay. As aspiration, that's not that you're not then going and trying to change every person in a car, but it's, um, it is like how we're inclining our mind. And I, I find it to be, you know, really inspiring this idea, which is, you know, I, I'm starting to notice you're doing it effortfully and then it does start to become more reflexively. You know, how can I loosen this ego clinging? 
again, not trying to become less of who we are, like I'm still me, I have my hopes, my dreams, my desires, but maybe loosening the idea that they're the most important ones around. And actually this idea of who I am is the thing I'm fighting for, as opposed to what I'm actually fighting for is to liberate all beings all time. That's, be, that's just a different way of holding ourselves, you know, and gets us closer to the meaning and purpose that whether you're looking at ancient or modern research shows will make you happy, right? We want to be aligned with meaning and purpose. That's what gives our life um, the true sense of happiness, not the hedonic happiness coming and going, but the true sense of happiness, what we cultivate and bring to the world. Um, yeah, so I think it's I think it's really good to, you know, tonight and I think every night we will and reading this book kind of just continue to get into what bodhicitta means as an intention. We'll do like a shorter practice with bodhicitta. Then we will um, we're actually going to finish chapter one tonight, I think. So we'll do a couple of the verses of you know understanding bodhicitta and understanding why we should be so compelled. Um, why it's so beneficial to, to us and to others. And then we will kind of make our way to this other aspect of teaching this book, which I've described before, you know, kind of an oscillating between, you know, generating compassion, generating compassion, generating these qualities of the heart. Welcome, come on in. Um, are there any empty seats around? There's one there. One more there? Great. Um, yes, yes. I'm wondering what the teachings say about the having, what is the line between when you do wish that other person well in traffic and take no action or continue driving or maybe pull over and let them pass versus situations where we really do need to advocate for ourselves? Mm -hmm. And like in your instance, you know, that you that you talked about that meeting you had, like there may be times when someone is being abusive or, mm -hmm. or you know, especially maybe for folks who have been marginalized or aren't used to doing that or tend to disappear or, yeah. you know, or have been disappeared. Yeah, know. yeah. Oh, keep it. <laughs> Curious for you, like when that does arise, what are you like relying on or how are you looking at that yourself? Because um, I do think that comes up for all of us, those questions. I'm sorry, could you explain that? What, yeah, so the question you're asking me, when that happens in your life, when there is an instance where it's like, yes, I actually, like, I believe in compassion and I want to reduce further suffering and I need to do something. Yeah, like what, how does that, how do you know when it's the right time and then how do you proceed? Well, there are there are some instances I think where there is like a level of safety and comfort enough that I'm a, that I'm able to um, pause. Best case scenario, take no action, and then you know when I know in my heart what's the right thing to do. Yeah, which is what's best for all parties involved. You know, to to do that. You know. It, tone can make a big difference if i yes. can kind of just calm myself down when the level of perceived threat is much higher especially like for me if there's like historical baggage related mm -hmm. to it then um there's there's times where i can be perplexed mm. and really you know take take no action which doesn't which doesn't feel like the yeah. right thing to do yeah yeah, yeah, beautifully described. And I think, you know, also that pause or that, you know, giving ourselves a little space around it. And then, you know, and this comes up always in compassion practices. How do we not practice what Pema Chodron calls doormat compassion, right? Or Chogyam Trumpa would just call idiot compassion, where you're just letting yourself get walked all over. And it's not okay and it's not compassionate to you and there's no you know obviously like hard line of whenever it's like this take action whenever it's like that don't there is still the instruction when you recognize that, that it, there's a need to take action you're doing so both for yourself and the other person 
So there's a beautiful line I was going to read later, but maybe I'll read it right here exactly to your point. Um, So, knowing where the root of happiness lies saves us from escalating pain. If someone insults you, for instance, you may long to retaliate, but you know this won't benefit anyone. Instead, in the very grip of wanting to get even, you can say to yourself, may the rage I feel towards this person cause both of us to be liberated. And I think you could have the same. May the boundary I'm creating with this person allow both of us to be liberated. So it's not whether taking action or inaction. It's are we infusing the action with a clear intention instead of creating further separation. So sometimes when we create that hard boundary, we kind of normally like other the other person, you know? And so can we like, this is absolutely inappropriate the way you're acting. And this is probably the, I mean, I love this phrase. This is probably the best you can do. Like, I always say that they're doing their best. They're doing their best. They're doing their best. And you can really feel that. And may they also be free from this. And it's really cool because sometimes our action is what helps them get more free. And sometimes it's our inaction that helps them get more free. It's not actually placing one above the other. Yeah, great question. Thank you. That's on page 23. Yes, that'll be the, the end of the chapter tonight. So yeah, so there's just to kind of close the loop on the practices we are tonight, we're going to work again with awareness, but we'll be doing both practices of awareness and practices of compassion. Because so beautifully, they both will lead us to this sense of spacious, open, clear um, awareness. When we're practicing compassion, and it really isn't just, you know, compassion for one being or compassion for a group of beings, but just this open, ultimate field of compassion, it has that same quality of spacious awareness as when we are looking and observing the mind and then resting in the mind. So it's kind of this very, there's many roots to the same place. And so I kind of want us to know that, you know, this, this destination, which, you know, the term in Tibetan is Rigpa, you know, clear light awareness, open awareness, spacious awareness. This is a place from which we can really allow our mind, heart, and body to feel at ease, open, and spacious. We can't necessarily walk through the entire world that way. It would be great if we could. But to be able to find that kind of nourishment through our practice really helps us walk through the world with compassion and with awareness. Just so you know the, the goal or the, the benefit. So we'll start with this practice of intention, kind of setting intention, settling in. Um, and again, I'll, I'll read the classic phrases here. And we can also find, hopefully, phrases that feel more aligned for us. All right. Does everybody have the space? Close the curtains. So take a moment and find a posture that supports you. Yeah. I don't think so. It's just too. Yeah. Okay. Just too much light. No problem. Yes. Got it. Um, no, just be mindful that you're missing a lot if you come in late, you know, because then there's build up and preamble and suspense, excitement. But no, good question. Always come if you can. 
So finding, yeah, this, this posture in which we have this beautiful balance of uprightness and vividness, relaxation and ease. Inviting in a beautiful breath that can just penetrate the entire body. And especially if it's one of your first times here and <clears throat> it's a newer space, you can consider keeping your eyes open or giving yourself an opportunity to really look around the room so that your body can feel a sense of space and place, more ease. And so much of practice is this very simple invitation to drop into the experience of being in the breathing body. And that means our attention slightly loosening around these other objects of mind, thoughts and memories and images. And just dropping in the body and dropping in the body, dropping into the body. Feel and imagine that there's a sense of ground rising up to meet you as you continue to release. And so as there's a release and relaxation, there's a stabilization, an uprightness of finding our true ground. Is there anywhere in the face that could be slightly released or relaxed? Maybe around the eyes or the jaw. Feel and imagine softening the heart, the belly. Moving through the world, we often contract and put a shield up, kind of gripping. Can we slightly soften and release? And we settle the body into this natural state where it finds its way to a sense of stillness. Natural stability. Steady. To help settle the mind, we continue closely attending to the sensations in the body. Mindful attention of what we're feeling in the body and the qualities of those sensations.
and you feel the body without needing to apply words or labels, just feeling the body from within the body. Thoughts arise, images and memories arise, no problem. Kindly, gently returning and saturating our body with presence, attention, with the quality of care and love. So as we notice sensations in the body, we do so not to identify or corner them, just to really bring ourselves into this full awareness of sensations in the body. Loving this body just as it is, all the sensations just as they are. Feeling the preciousness of each moment. So often we are inclining our mind towards what's next or what just happened. Can we have a love affair with this moment? Its sounds and sensations, just the fullness of experiencing the moment through the body. Attending to the body in this way, we may notice that the body starts to feel both more substantial and less substantial. Saturated with awareness, presence, the body has a fullness and also can feel a bit less heavy and dense right at the same time as the radiance of the subtle body or the energy body becomes more available. And then shifting away from this presence and sense of moment to moment awareness with the body, considering turning towards our own heart, 
letting this simple inquiry question land without immediately needing to answer it or know, just waiting for what arises. And considering this question of what is my intention for coming here tonight? Maybe we can even ask ourselves again, what is truly my intention for coming here tonight? What does the heart or mind long for, seek? And then letting whatever word or phrase or image arises really settle in the body and the mind. And then we consider opening our heart to bodhicitta, to this intention that is vast as sky and space, even beyond. And considering whether these words feel meaningful to enter into this experience of bodhicitta as a resting place for the heart. As long as space endures, as long as there are beings to be found, may I continue to likewise remain to drive away the sorrows of the world. May I be an island for those who need landfall, a lamp for those seeking light. May I be a bed to rest for those who are weary, and for those who are suffering and sick. May I be both medicine and doctor. May I create this mind as a place of peace and refuge for the sake of all beings. Very moving to think of you all taking that refuge. Thank you for um, trying it on. So we're going to move on in this first chapter and then do one more practice inviting our familiarity with awareness of awareness. Um, but before we do so, it would be great if anyone had any questions or reflections. And before we do that, just a reminder that in order for us to be here in Sangha together, we have to be really mindful of our compassion in action, our compassion in how we're listening to one another, our compassion in how we're speaking to one another, and as much as possible, really living that core ethic of non-harming, right? Just how can I be mindful of what my words may implicate and noticing our judgment as we're listening to others and as always making space for many voices here too so any questions or comments yes in the back 
Might have to come get it, yeah. So I had an emotion during the um, meditation that I wanted to ask you about. I had a week off last week just to ponder burnout and have some space, and it was wonderful. Yes. It made me think about how I show up differently when I have more space. Mm. I could spend an entire afternoon just like sitting there pondering and journaling and mm. realizing how differently I act when I have four hours instead of 10 minutes in a meet, right? Yeah. And so it gave me a lot of time to think first to go through the first phase of being like super annoyed at everyone else and then realizing, eh, maybe it's not that big a deal. Mm. And then finally getting to the point of like, man, I, I caused that. Mm. Oh man, I'm back to work this week. I'm still in that like spaciousness. And so I had this thought during the emotion, this emotion during the meditation, I should say, I was like, man, it's a bodhicitta thing. It feels, I feel like I could do a little bit of that. Mm. And then the emotion was, who the hell am I to be the light to all beings? Mm. <laughs> who the hell am I to even think I should do this thing? Yeah. And then I caught myself and I was like, I should ask you about this emotion because <laughs> this is interesting. Yes. Really glad you had time off, first okay. of all. As a recently unemployed person, I'm really into it. Um, <laughs> God, it's great. Uh, and it is to have spaciousness. It really helps. It really helps. And it's not forever for most of us. So to really enjoy it, may others also benefit from my spaciousness. Um, what you know, so what you're describing is actually not an emotion, but a beautiful example of Mara, of doubt. Right, so right before the Buddha awakened, you know, the very classic story, he is seen so clearly into the dependent co-rising of all things. He looks at a leaf and he sees clouds and earth and sky, recognizing that everything implicates everything and there's no separation and kind of just this profound deep seeing and, you know, there's thunder and storms and the trees are quaking and there's uh, blossoms everywhere. And Mara, who's kind of this fabled like demon type, but of course the demon isn't out there, the demon's in here, comes and says, who are you to wake up in this life? Who are you? Right? And, um, and there's like that very, so not saying, well, maybe, maybe you're about to awaken. Um, let's hope so. And if not, there'll be another chance. Um, but this idea of like that doubt that comes in, it's just so common. You know, and it's just such a kind of timeless affliction for us to be working with and holding. And, you know, the story goes that then Buddha says, you know, the earth is my witness that I deserve this. Deserve is like a really loaded word. And what it actually means, it's not like the earth is like, yeah, I got you, Buddha. Like, I'm here with you, like, for sure. You know, it's more like I have, the earth has witnessed Buddha for thousands of lifetimes developing bodhicitta. Has watched Buddha over and over and over learn how to be more and more compassionate by offering itself, whether it is like a, you know, there's, so many different beautiful stories of the Buddha as a deer and as a heron and as he's many times a prince. I don't know how <laughs> he manages that. And uh, he's a prince who offers his body to the hungry tigress who's starving to death. He's like, so it's like all, it's like the earth isn't just like, yeah, Buddha, you got it. Like the, the, the earth is, I've seen all the seeds you have planted in your mind and heart for thousands of years. So I wonder, you know, in our everyday context, if, you know, your cushion chair could be like, Raph, I've seen you sitting here, you know, dedicating yourself to practice. And that is your, you know, that's your ground, right? We are our own ground. And to really, it's a different kind of quality, spiritual confidence than kind of pumped up, like, I got this. It's like, no. Like this, my witness, there's this really famous story about Milarepa's teacher. I've probably said this before. And he, Milarepa, a wonderful um, Indian sage who, you know, dedicated himself to practice. Very interesting story for another time. And when he sought out his teacher um, and he asked, you know, what do I need in order to, you know, develop farther on the path? Like, tell me everything, show me everything. 
And the teacher turns around, lifts up his kind of skirt, and there's like calluses on his butt. And he's like, sit. <laughs> sit. <laughs> Which is like, you know, interesting. So like, you know, use that like, I am sitting with this, I am doing this, I'm applying myself. Like, oh, I took the week of spaciousness to give myself an opportunity to deepen. Like. There's a wholesome spiritual confidence so that when that doubt, which naturally arises, arises, I'm like, yeah, I see you. And I, my guess is that doubt's like, is there all the time? And you have a little bit of space to actually notice it. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other? Yes. Yes, and then Tom. So I was reflecting on my intentions and um, it came in this need to place myself in situations that are conducive to my evolution. Mm. And then right after that, uh, the intention, the longing for truth and mm. liberation. Mm. And then I felt a sense of uh, deep gratitude mm. to have access to high level teachings mm. and to be to have the good karma to have, you know, teachers that have uh, high integrity mm. and then uh, very much feeling a sense of uh, wishing for all beings to have access yeah. to truth beautiful like feeling so blessed and you know really feeling that um prayer yeah for all mm -hmm. beautiful yeah and that's you know some people don't love this word but that's the heart of devotion right when we recognize like wow, what I truly need in my life is this sense of truth and I want to keep following that and oh my God, it's available mm -hmm. for me to do it. And that's, that's like, again, it's putting us in our uh, appropriate place with the world. Devotion isn't like, I'm going to put one teacher up here or, you know, it's just like, wow, like I am available for this. It is available and it can transform all beings. I hope everybody has it. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you. Yes, and I think Tom over there. So I was walking here along 24th Street, and as you can imagine, there's lots of suffering out there. Yeah. And I realized, you know, and I'm trying to play with this and feel what it's like to have an intention that that person who's sleeping on the sidewalk, who's whatever is going on with them, that they become free. And it feels like that, that what comes of that, like I've got the intention and then the intention, it feels like, well, what next? I know that it's, you know, I've done charitable work, I've mm -hmm. done professional work around yeah. these kinds of issues, but it's sort of like, you know, that's all at this kind of level of funding agencies that do this kind of work and blah, 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 which is important, but it also feels like there's this guy yeah. right there. Yeah. And it feels like there's a way that I can walk through the world that's guarded and not see. Yeah. And um, it feels better. I'm sorry. <laughs> it just feels like, I mm. admit that it feels like I'm not, and just to, be, to try to be open and have this intention and then feel like I can't do anything. Mm. Like, yeah, it, it feels painful. Yeah. And, you know, maybe that's part of what I have to go through to that. Maybe that's part of, you know, that it's not necessarily this blissful experience of wishing yeah. well, but that there's also a kind of pain about it. And I'm just mm. kind of, I'm, yeah, I'm just kind of curious as to what yeah. you think about what's next after having the intention and um, making something other than just, I'm a good person because I have an intention. Yeah, beautiful question. And just like if I, I would paraphrase it of, you know, the reality is closing down the heart and not seeing the suffering can sometimes feel better, right? Yeah. Than opening the heart and not knowing quite what to do. And, um, you know, I think that's, it's such a good question. There's, there's a couple parts to it. And, and one is, you know, when we kind of open ourselves to that suffering, there does have to be a sense, you know, that again, in order for us to really offer bodhicitta, we have to transform this heart and mind, making my mind a place of peace and refuge so that then we can offer it. And so it makes sense that if in that moment, you know, we're not connected to that in ourself, it can feel like the self-related concern. So it's described in uh -huh. empathic distress, 
is not necessarily I'm so distressed by this person. I mean, we are, but we're distressed by what I can't do. And it's about us. And so we've inadvertently kind of reified like me in relation to this person. And, you know, back to the way um, I think I said that, you know, Ken McLeod had this beautiful way of describing bodhicitta as being able to really see the beauty and goodness that already is possible for someone and to see that in them and wish them to see that too. And so it's not just like, I want you to be free from material lack, which is true, right? You would like this person to be better, um, you know, housed or fed or nourished or supported. Um, but there's also the, may the goodness in you be revealed to you. And that's a little different. And it kind of lifts up the dignity and integrity of other beings, you know, which I think is, it, and so I'm glad you bring it up because I think that's a really interesting one. And, and sometimes our compassion can be so more um, accidentally or slide into pity and despair. Like, oh, I really wouldn't want to be like that. I'm sorry you're like that. And God, I feel bad because I can't help. And that is isn't is normal. Who feels that sometimes, right? And you're like, no, I'm going to look away or, you know, and so very natural. But this idea, you know, um, uh, I had an opportunity to, to talk. I've, I've talked about Alan Wallace, who's my root teacher, my very first teacher, and he's on indefinite retreat. But he took a, a day today to, to, to chat um, and have a little conversation. And one thing he was saying is he keeps asking, like, what more meaningful can I do in the world other than be on retreat right now? And keeps getting the answer like this is the way I support bodhicitta in the world. So lovely. Um, but more to the point of the distress, there was something else he said. Um, I told him we'd all be here tonight. He's written many translations of the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life and uses this text like extensively. Oh, he was talking about when he first went to Dharamsala in 1971 to start learning Tibetan and practicing with others. There was not a single working toilet in the whole um, village of Dharamsala at that time. And yet there, and there was so much suffering and so much trauma from people who were escaping and who were refugees, um, Tibetans at the time. And there was also such clear, you know, you could go in with the eyes of, wow, I feel so bad for these people. They have nothing. God, what can I do? But what he saw was they have the greatest treasure I've ever seen like these warm hearts, this openness. And so it made me also think of what are we not seeing when we inadvertently fall into that pity kind of compassion for others, right? It kind of flattens that person into that moment of their suffering and not to deny the reality of that suffering, but kind of holding it with, they may have been another person in another time, they may be in another situation in another time, like seeing in some ways like the, um, the equanimity, the flow with our compassion. Yeah, thank you. thank you. Yeah, let me know how it goes. Ongoing investigations. Um, anyone else on intention and aspiration and kind of setting that up as one part of our practice? Yeah, and I, I think it's um, it's really meaningful to do. If you have a regular sitting practice, really consider, is there a phrase? Oh, I see that. Okay, thanks, Cage. Um, is there a phrase of bodhicitta that is meaningful? Is there a line? Is there a word? Or you could just add it in to the beginning of your practice, just to start making it feel familiar. Um, it can be the words from Shantideva. It can be in another form. I've played in practice with many different versions, and I, I find I have to switch it up a lot, or else it's like, I just get used to it and I'm just saying it and it's not, you know, hitting anymore. So, okay, sunflower friend with their hand up. Hey, um, I, is there an echo? No, okay. There's not for us. Great, great, great. I keep um, thinking of how you and Chandra helped me learn Tonglen so much and how that mm. became a habit in so many yes. settings. And um, and I was thinking, too, of a homeless person in uh, at the court in Los Angeles who 
it just and some other people who you think at first you pity, you want to give them food and you do <laughs> give them good meals and stuff, but who also give real blessings and things that you you don't realize. Um, right. Last week, I was in a situation I haven't been in for a long time where I suddenly thought I was about to be assaulted. Oh, and boy. I got out of there quick. <laughs> But what I didn't do that I normally would have done, and I've um, sort of been trying to get back to that place where I'm really grounded and meditating in this way, um, was Tonglen. I mean, mm. I would have gotten out of there quickly, um, but the whole attitude and energy around it was so different. And I just really want to thank you for, um, mm. for centering us so much. And um, anyway, thank you for sharing. And I'm so sorry. That sounds pretty terrifying. Um, and glad you are safe. Um, and absolutely right. You know, in the moment when we are literally moving towards safety out of true bodily threat or harm, there might not be time to practice. And we can always practice after. You know, there's no you know, we can at the end of the day really like review and reflect um, and offer. And I think we did Tonglen the very first night of this book and we will do it again. Oh yeah, probably next week after we do, or two more weeks from now. So I think oscillating between these practices of compassion and settling the mind in its natural state is a very good um, gymnasium for bodhicitta. <laughs> okay, great. So we're gonna get into these verses and again for folks for whom it's your first time here tonight the way that this text is organized is it has these short verses and then commentary by Pema Chodron and she's bringing a bit more of a psychological and relational lens to these ancient um, texts here okay so let's see here If with kindly generosity, one merely has the wish to soothe the aching heads of other beings, such merit knows no bounds. No need to speak then of the wish to drive away the endless pain of each and every living being, bringing them unbounded virtues. Could our fathers or mothers ever have so generous a wish? Do the very gods, rishis, and even Brahma harbor such benevolence as this? For in the past, they never even in their dreams conceived such profit even for themselves. How could they have such aims for others' sakes? And so this idea, the first two stanzas of one merely has the wish to soothe the aching heads of other beings. So the way that Pema describes it is, um, it's wonderful for us to wish for one person's headache to be soothed, but even better if everybody could be relieved. So what maybe we you know, run into a friend and they're like, oh man, I'm just having chronic back pain. And immediately the bodhicitta arises, the desire, I wish they were free from that pain. And then what if in that moment, I wish everyone with lower back pain would be free. So it's like, it's just like using every little alteration there. And um, yeah, it's, it's, I've read this stanza before, but I think it's so beautiful, this idea of don't worry about the results. So also with that, Tom, and, and he actually, she uses the example of um, this, uh, this Roshi, the Zen Roshi, Bernard Glassman Roshi, who worked with homeless in Yonkers, New York. He said he knew there was no way to end homelessness, yet he would devote his life to trying. This is an aspiration of the bodhisattva. Don't worry about results. Just open your heart in an inconceivably big way, in that limitless way that be benefits everyone you encounter. Don't worry if it's doable. The intention is vast. May everyone's physical pain be relieved. And even more to the point, may everyone attain enlightenment. And then this stanza about could our fathers and mothers ever have such a generous wish? And, and you know, if we were fortunate to have um, attuned enough parents, 
they wanted the best for us, right? And they would, you know, sacrifice and do um, whatever was possible for our well-being. But this is suggesting that that's really only meeting our hedonic well-being. Like not even our parents, well, unless maybe you have Buddhist parents, would wish for you <laughs> to achieve, or our Buddhist parents, uh, would wish for you to achieve bodhicitta. Like would wish for you the actual thing that would make you happiest. So not like, am I getting into the right preschool, which is the pipeline to going to an Ivy League university? Are you, you know, are you going to meet the person of your dreams? Are you going to get married? You do all these things that were like, that'll make you happy. Like who's had their parent tell them something where you know your parent thinks it's going to make you happy, but you're like, absolutely, that won't make me happy. Anybody? Right, you know, so it's like they're, they're delusional because they're <laughs> humans. And so if they had clear seeing, they would want, oh, all I want for my child is for them to have bodhicitta because that would be the true source of happiness. But that's usually not, right, the first thing. So this, this beautiful idea is that, you know, not even in their dreams could you conceive of this if it's not something you know of. So Pema says, our fathers and mothers may be very kind and they want what's best for us, but can they free us from our habitual patterns? Our habitual patterns are self-centered. We want our right of way. We want to go first, right? What this self-centeredness shows up in many of the ways that our bodhicitta gets blocked. And that's why bodhicitta is such a clear antidote to kind of the self-grasping. And we just practice it. You know, just not just for me, for everyone, not just me first, for everyone. Um, and then the next line, for beings do not wish their own true good. So how could they intend it for another's sake? The state of mind so precious and rare arises truly wondrous, never seen before. And this idea of what do we actually wish for another when we have aspiration for them to be free? Um, he said, and Pema says that Shantideva is talking about all of us who don't understand, we aren't able to wish what's best for us, but working with habitual patterns is not our priority. We are not impassioned about de-escalating our emotions and prejudices or awakening bodhicitta, but this is the true good and this could be our main focus. We just want to get through the day without a mishap. We don't want to be bothered. We don't want to deal with people who give us grief. But if we don't have a bigger aspiration, how could we want this for others? We can only wish for others what we value for ourselves. So again, this beautiful interweaving of bodhicitta, yes, it's for everyone, numerous, numerous beings, never able to actually count all of them of all time, and we need to know what that feels like for us in order to wish it appropriately. Um, so very benevolent for us. The pain dispelling draft, this cause of joy for those who wander through the world, this precious attitude, this jewel of mind, how could it be gauged or quantified? So this, again, he's, you know, with beautiful hyperbole, you know, it's a pain dispelling draft. It's a jewel of the mind. And it helps us to get unhooked from the drama that we are with all of our life. Um, you know, instead of our passions being towards more status, more success, or more whatever, the passions to alleviate greater suffering. For if the simple thought to be, help, to be of help to others exceeds in worth the worship of the Buddhas, what need is there to speak of the actual deeds that bring about and wheel the benefits of beings. For beings long to free themselves from misery, but misery itself they follow and pursue. They long for joy, but in their ignorance destroy it as they would a hated enemy. Very famous line here. So in, we long to free ourselves from misery, but it's in misery that we, I'm gonna say we, we follow and pursue. We long for joy, but in our ignorance, we destroy it as we would a hated enemy. Um, and this is kind of, this will be a theme that comes back many times in the text of if we are seeking, if what we think life is about is the hedonic pursuit of momentary pleasure, we're gonna live a life that's really unpleasant and difficult as we are seeking a life that is good, right? And 
it's kind of knowing there's a famous line of the Buddha of like knowing, you know, craving until its end. So sometimes there's an example of, you know, if you're, you know, your craving is for ice cream. Um, any, I just want ice cream. Oh God, I'll be so happy when I get ice cream. Eat as much ice cream until it makes you sick. Like no craving until its end. You know, because we often don't see like the full consequence of our craving. We have this like very temporary view of it. And then we get hooked on the next thing and the next thing. And how do we actually get craving for what's wholesome and sustainable? You know, craving for bodhicitta. Like that's really um, what the aspiration is. But those who fill with bliss all beings destitute of joy, who cut all pain and suffering away, from those weighted down with misery, who drive away the darkness of their ignorance, what virtue could be matched? What friend could be compared to them? What merit is there similar to this? If they who do some good, oh, sorry. So those two stanzas are essentially, again, just um, reflecting on how, what an amazing generosity it is to offer someone bodhicitta maybe even to tell them about bodhicitta so they themselves can practice it and be more free. This inconceivable wish to help all sentient beings always begins with ourselves. And it's our own experience that we actually are able to share. We can't pretend to be more awake or more compassionate than we actually are. Much of our realization comes from honest recognition of our foibles, the inability to measure up to our own standards is decidedly humbling. It allows us to empathize with other people's difficulties. So we're getting set up for the next chapter in which we really come clean on the ways that, um, you know, we are not compassionate in the ways that we still struggle. And then let's see here, what time is it? Okay, I want us to just, these last three stanzas um, yeah, they kind of, again, it's like his last chance in this chapter to describe why we should try bodhicitta. And to those who harbor evil, this first use word evil in their minds, and, and here what's meant by evil is not just having a passing thought of being annoyed or frustrated, but to really perpetuate hatred, you know, to engage with and energize feelings of those people are wrong and bad, and I, I wish they weren't here. So for those who harbor evil in their mind against such lords of generosity, the Buddha's heirs, will stay in hell, the mighty one has said, for ages equal to the moment of their malice. So this is a really, again, strong way of saying, if you are engaging and energizing in destructive and harmful thoughts, that's where you're gonna stay. Right. If you want to look at the future, consider where your mind is thinking, what your mind is thinking of right now. If you understand the past, right, like what were you thinking of? Where was your mind? Our reality is constructed. So our hell is created. Our hell isn't out there. Our hell is what are the kind of negative, difficult, painful thoughts we continue to endorse. By contrast, good and virtuous thoughts will yield abundant fruits in greater measure. Even in adversity, the bodhisattvas never bring forth evil, only an increasing stream of goodness. To them in whom this precious sacred mind is born, I bow. I go for refuge in that source of happiness that brings its very enemies to perfect bliss. And, and Alan actually talked about this today when I said, I'm you know, teaching on bodhicitta tonight. What do you, what, you know, what comes up? And he says, it's really great to read the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. It's also just as important to look for examples of people who are actually engaging in bodhicitta, people who are in embodiments of that generosity, of that kindness towards others. That that, and so he says, I go for refuge, you know, um, in the source of happiness, those who can bring their enemies perfect bliss. Right? Yeah. Like people who, you know, you see them getting provoked or getting upset and they meet it with such clarity and kindness. They might take action, they might be whatever, but you can see 
like the depth of the peace of their mind, the depth of their compassion. And I even watched, um, some of you know, my dad is a um, psychologist. He studied emotion and I know Alan through my dad and my dad, very he's 90 years old. He remembers some things well and some things not as well. But every time I see him, he says, how's Alan? He doesn't remember like he's really not. And, and there's a connection that they have um, from 20 years ago. So I reached out to Alan on retreat and I said, you know, my dad doesn't remember breakfast, but he always asks about you. I just want you to know that, that there's such a deep and beautiful connection. And then Alan writes, let's have a Zoom call. And if it didn't, you know, he's on retreat permanently. I didn't think this would happen. <laughs> anyway, we're there um, today getting to, to hear these two kind of chat with each other. And my dad, um, you know, has hearing issues, has seeing issues. He's not a Zoom guy, like he has, <laughs> not his thing and so Alan would speak and he's like huh can you repeat that and I was like wow dad wow okay but Alan like you could see the bodhicitta that he's practicing and he just said of course wait let me get my airpods and put that like I was already annoyed on his behalf but to just see like oh like such warmth such care you know like not that moment of agitation um so that's a, a beautiful reminder so let's do some practice together, but let's stand up and move. It's like hot in here. Not just like a Nelly song. <laughs> Don't do that. No, <laughs> not that kind of night. You are super welcome to keep standing. Meditating standing is wonderful. You're also welcome if there's more cushions, if you want to sit on the floor, more space on the floor. So we're gonna do a little experiment before we go into this practice. Last week, we started kind of step one and two. Step one, awareness of thoughts. And feeling and imagining that these thoughts, they're in the foreground of the mind. That's not technically true. There's no foreground and background, but just that sense of giving the thoughts a space or place where we could identify them. And then the second step is kind of leaning back in the mind to the background and finding the space between the thoughts. And then today we'll take the third step of becoming aware of that which notices we're thinking. So awareness of our awareness. And then in a just beautiful simplicity, resting in awareness. That might just happen for a couple seconds. We all can stumble into it. It doesn't actually take a lot of skill or talent, but the skill and talent is continuing to notice when we have gotten caught back up in a thought, return to the space in which the thought arose and awareness. And so it's important for us to first really be able to recognize what is it like when a thought arises? So I'm going to give us just a moment or two to let ourselves think and notice how a thought arises, where it arises from. And if we don't energize it, where does it go?
for folks at home, not here, but for folks at home, you can just speak aloud as the thoughts arise. And for folks here, imagine the horror and embarrassment if you actually were speaking those thoughts aloud. Like give yourself like that level of attending to what's arising. Why does my knee hurt? Will I have a snack later? Right, this <laughs> note, just really give yourself a couple moments to see if you can notice like what is the thought content that arises. And is there a space between the thought content? the movement of the mind and the stillness of the mind. Okay. And then coming back to this room for a moment. Is everyone able to observe a thought, kind of. I know it's weird and it, it can be, a, it's like a really important step before this practice or else you're just gonna be quite confused. What was it like when a thought arose, anybody? I feel mine come this way and go that way, but that's probably me imagining. Yours go out, up and out. Okay, to a certain point. Do they dissolve? You just go down. Yeah. I'm thinking about it like a spiral. Okay. Kind of much of like garbage, like going down a drain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you made the dark with like a flashlight and then sometimes you could follow each piece of trash and throw it into the drain. Hmm. But maybe it just pops into the field of view further and further away. It does that. Yeah. And could you watch it arise without getting like totally fused with it? Sometimes. You should even kind of see it coming. You ever notice that? Okay, cool. That's the level we want to get like really curious. And it's hard because we always think that the thoughts are something we're not supposed to do in meditation. But, you know, they are. I was reading um, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, such a classic, and yet I never read it. And such a beautiful way of writing about, you know, the the mind is this spacious, you know, water or ocean and the thoughts are like waves, which is a very common metaphor, but it is the nature of water to make waves. And I, I like that phrasing. It's the nature of mind to think, not a problem, but we're learning how to be with it in a different way so that we can have a bit more of that experience of water. So, if that doesn't make sense, no problem. So many metaphors, just trying to point out what's just always right here and yet so kind of, you know, because you can't see it, you can't feel it, there's no color, there's no taste. It can be very hard to rest in the awareness between thoughts, but let's give it a try. As much as possible, immediately slipping back into that sense of embodied presence, embodied awareness. Following the breath very closely, very tenderly through inhale and exhale.
so important for this practice to have a sense of pliability and relaxation in the body. And so the mind can also feel pliable and relaxed. So see and notice if there's any areas of tension that want to be released through the next exhale. And traditionally, this practice, we have our eyes slightly open to let in some light. If that's just too distracting to you, no problem. And when we have our eyes open, we are paying attention to not focus on any one thing. Almost as though the softness of the gaze allows us to see the full panorama, the full edges of what can be seen. And not getting caught on one single area. And we begin by allowing ourselves to notice and observe the thoughts in the foreground. We don't have to label them or identify them, just noticing their bubble-like quality, just kind of bubbling up, arising, dissipating. If you notice you've been caught up in a thought, engaging with the fantasy or idea, no problem. Resetting. You could imagine as though the thoughts were passing by in front of a screen, as though they were just coming out in front on the stage and then passing back behind a curtain. Soften the gaze, soften the body, and lean back in the mind. Notice the foreground of thoughts and any gaps, any opportunities of awareness. And taking a moment to turn awareness onto awareness. What is aware of the next thought arising? What is that knowing quality?
it may feel confusing, but consider, can I just observe awareness primarily instead of the thoughts arising within awareness? This is not a mental event or experience. It's a felt sense in body, heart, mind. This deep leaning back to the space of the mind. Thoughts still coming and going. Remembering to relax in the body, relax in the mind. And we could even use the breath for oscillation as we inhale, becoming aware of our awareness. And as we exhale, releasing into awareness, no observer, no observed. When we get carried away or wake up in the thought, no problem. Relax, relax, return. Making our way from observing the thought to observing the space between thoughts. To observing or becoming aware of awareness. to resting in unconfigured, vast, open, spacious awareness. Gently coming back to the body and breath. Allowing the eyes to be closed if they were open. Notice the quality of the body and mind and heart. Maybe there's a presence of something pleasant. Awareness isn't a cold vacuity. It's also the warm space of ultimate bodhicitta. The heart's full flourishing of compassion. And gently placing hands together at the heart. 
in a gesture of offering our practice. May all of our collected energy and intentions and aspirations, all of our practice and connection be in service for all beings of all time, knowing their true nature, experiencing love and belonging, being free from inner and outer harm, being completely and totally and perfectly free. My apologies, I got a little too deep into spacious awareness. I would love to hear any comments. It's 8.30, if you have to go, no problem. But I would love to hear, we went a bit farther than we've gone with this practice. So I'd love to hear from a couple people what you noticed, what was hard, how you feel. Yes, please. Um, I noticed a couple things. One is uh, once I start observing the, my thoughts and like con- almost consciously doing that, it seems like there are less random thoughts that come up. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think I tend to get more carried away unconsciously by like the stream of like, right. consciousness or whatever it is yeah. um, throughout the day. And, yep. Um, yeah, and so I feel like that's a really good mm-hmm. for me to notice is that if I can become yes. aware, then it sort of just like dampens it. Yep. Um, the other is I had it like this sort of strange image where with the like observing my thoughts and then observing the observer, mm-hmm. and then it started going back further and further. Yeah. And like the fun house mirror. Yes. And I was like, Yes. Um, I've never experienced that before, and it was a little trippy. But yes, um, very naturally yeah. trippy. Yeah. So beautiful. Um, yeah. Really that beautiful. is. Yeah. I mean, there's no like competition, but it's a very confirming sign of practice. It's a very common, like, well documented experience to have that. Like, and then, you know, it can just completely keep going and dissolve. And especially if you didn't feel any like uh, like tightness to it. No. Great. It's so strange. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's weird. Did anybody feel something like enjoyment or bliss in that space? That's not the point, but it is nice. Mm. And that like going back and back, you know, like it's a nourishment for us. It is like, you know, that's the nectar um, as is sometimes described of our own true nature. And that like going back, going back, going back is just, it's really helping us see things as they are. Like we are living in this like ensconced little body thing, but like it's just huge, this, you know, this whole world is huge, right? And we, and just that going back, at least how I experienced that is just like, it's this kind of falling into the cosmos and like you're, there's no ground. Mm-hmm. And that is the space, so, yeah, like, spacious, true spacious awareness. And um, some people can make them very, have existential terror, Um, but hopefully, because we were more in the body, I think that helps avoid it. Yeah, I think if if I was in a different headspace. Yeah. yeah. And then to your first point, I mean, bliss and non-duality, cool, but the first point you made (laughs) of like noticing that the mind that loves to worry and the mind that loves to get caught up like that, that that actually can settle. Mm -hmm. You know, I think about that a lot during the day. I allow myself to just like run wild with rumination and thoughts, like when I have a moment or two free and I'm just like, no, 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 no. But I could focus on spacious awareness, Mm -hmm. you know, on, and, and you're right, it gets cleaner and clearer. I'm still like biking through the city or doing what I'm doing. 
but I'm a little bit less living in this fantasy world and energizing this fantasy world that's often like, you know, just the mind of hope and fear, up and down, up and down. Thank you. Yes, please. A comment, a comment on that, that wandering. I've noticed that if I wake up and I don't practice or I don't get enough sleep or there's all these other things that happen, I can't control that. Yeah, I you know. It just keeps going. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, I noticed specifically in that practice, uh, I started like, that kind of almost like a ghost was coming out of me and I was observing my own self mm -hmm. from above. And I, as you were saying to breathe in and out, I would breathe in and I would feel all the sensations in my body and then I would breathe, no, I'll breathe in, I'll go out. And then when I breathe out, I would come in. Yeah. And it was very interesting. Yeah. Um, Again, it's like, it's just cool to see that awareness doesn't necessarily live exclusively in the body and in the brain like awareness might be vaster yeah. and to feel that you know and it's it's not like it's not you know sometimes it can just feel like a trick or something we're like achieving and i don't i i do think it's so beautiful to exercise the mind and conscious awareness beyond the boundaries that we usually do yeah. so beautiful yeah and I, yes, no problem. Again, please leave when you need to. And sorry to go over, but I, I should know better, but sometimes I get a little lost in the spacious <laughs> awareness myself. Um, I uh, had an interesting experience. It wasn't as spacious as what it sounds like a lot of people had. I normally, when I come into these spaces, it's usually pretty chill. Like, because this is such a calming place, mm. really always struggle but i do in my day-to-day -day life struggle with like intrusive thoughts mm -hmm. and it was interesting because i was sitting here relatively chill and then like through the first practice i was feeling a really easy time noticing my thoughts and i was like all right we're here this is great feeling it and then the second time a thought came up that almost even sparked like anxiety in my stomach mm. and I, it was like that um that uh filing cabinet that just like runs out and just like barrels through your head mm. and I was like holy shit mm -hmm. um and then so it was interesting to have to back out of that and it was almost like I had to like let go of even trying to do anything mm. like, get back to like a neutrality mm -hmm. before attempting anything so I've never sat in a space where that usually happens when I'm at work and there's like 50 other things happening too so yeah it's, just, like, it's almost like the stress of work goes with the intrusive thoughts, like everything gets riled up, but I've not been sitting calmly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, again, the bliss and disembodiment's nice. Yeah. And <laughs> having insight into the nature of anxiety is really nice too, right? Because we get to really take full measure of like, whoa, this is what is happening. And when we are, essentially what we're practicing at a very simple level is just decentering, right? We're just getting a little space from the experience that often is just running without awareness. Mm -hmm. And so then what arises in awareness can be, you can get a lot of insights into it. And so it sounds like you were able to pull out from it. Yeah. So, and again, it's really rough intrusive thoughts. And I, and I don't think meditation, like you said, they come from work. It doesn't perpetuate them and we become more sensitive to them, mm -hmm. you know, Luckily, we're also becoming more resilient to them, but there is that. And it, instead of it running the show behind the scenes and promoting all these activities and behaviors that are probably, you know, trampling the very source of joy we seek, we have some more options. So, yeah, thank you. Um, so I normally label my thoughts as they come up, and I noticed all of them were storytelling. And I noticed no other thought had words with them. And then I started to think maybe the storyteller is the observer. Mm. And then when they didn't have words, because we talked about this last week, I thought that was really interesting. They were like a feeling or a sensation. An image. 
image. Image, yeah, or totally. Or know what it is, but there are no words. Yes. It's just, it's yeah. a teeny tiny little thing. So image. cool. Yeah, there is a non a nonverbal language of thoughts, right? Language is actually fairly recent in human history. So we have thoughts without words. And to get to that pre-verbal place of being able to sense knowing without thought, it's just, it's another layer of that onion. And just interesting to observe the just raw knowingness. So thank you. You guys are killing it. Don't worry if you also just were ruminating the whole time. <laughs> That's part of it. Okay, yeah. We'll do last comment. So to add on that, um, my I noticed that my uh, thoughts, uh, when I noticed it, I, it became shapes, very neutral, but different colors. It wasn't that vivid, but I wanted to share that I was like wake sleeping hmm. once I got to that point hmm. and I didn't want to go out of it. Yeah, I, I know, me neither. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Thank you. very cool. Yeah, and I think, you know, it sounds like you were pretty aware, not dull in that state, but there are these interesting kind of waking hypnagogic states and the imagery can really come where we're like, oh, thoughts are just shapes and it is and literally you read about this in psychedelic literature also right similar decentering process a little bit different neurologically but not entirely and you get that opportunity to experience your mind as though it's not your mind it's mind and that's so liberating when can also arise as we recognize the thoughts that arise and we're like they aren't just storytelling they're self-criticism judgment you know we can actually have some understanding of them and 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 often and i don't know if anyone caught this but this space this unconditioned space of awareness is bodhicitta ultimate bodhicitta i know that might not make sense just take it as a poem as opposed to a, a thought but there's such warmth that is naturally always here in that unconditioned space of awareness too I find that very inspiring. My God, I'm so sorry. Um, very quickly, there's still spaces on the Esalen retreat, August 4th through 11th with myself and Lopan Chandra. Love to see anyone there. I am starting to dream and scheme up a uh, different kind of um, practice group. I've talked with some folks about that here. It would be um, weekly two hours and or a six week format of weekends. I'm trying to figure out what's the best way to offer an ongoing closed Sangha in addition to this drop in Sangha. If that is at all interesting to you, please sign up at the front. I just left a little piece of paper there, Sarana has. Um, just starting to scheme and dream, probably only be 16 people at the beginning, um, but I will send out info. You can explore from there. Um, this is the Dharma Collective, it is an entirely volunteer run space. If you've never been here before, we're so happy you're here. Come again, tell everybody. We need your support financially to stay open, so your generosity really matters.